Hello, my YouTube family. This is your wake up call. Let's talk about reparations. On January 3rd, 2019, Bill H.R. 40, commissioned to study and develop reparations proposals for African Americans Act was introduced into Congress. It was first introduced in January of 1989 by John Conyers and has been reintroduced every Congress since then and will continue to do so until it's passed into law. You will probably never hear anything about it again because Congress simply doesn't care. This bill establishes the commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. The commission shall examine slavery and discrimination in the colonies and the United States from 1619 to the present and recommend appropriate remedies. Among other requirements, the commission shall identify, one, the role of federal and state governments in supporting the institution of slavery, two, forms of discrimination in the public and private sectors against freed slaves and their descendants, and three, lingering negative effects of slavery on living African Americans and society. Now, on paper, this sounds like a no-brainer. All of these things exist in some way, shape, or form to this very day. In practice, white supremacy, anti-black sentiment, and simply put, race hate will prevent any of these things from happening. A black family, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we reside in a country where racism is at the very core of its existence. Mr. Neville, you and your people, you talk about reparations. The reparations that you talk about, Mr. Neville, your people already got your reparations. <laughs> Your reparations, your reparations came in the form of a man named Barack Obama. Please hold your response. My advice to you, my advice to you, if you don't like it here in America, planes leave every hour from Tampa Airport. Go back to Africa. Go back to Africa. Go back. Collectively, this country does not like us or wants us here, despite the fact they cannot function without our presence. I know, it's either insanity or brain damage, maybe a combination of the two. So over many years, the topic of reparations for black people has been getting louder. One of our issues is the fact that our own community's ignorance keeps us distracted from those things that are most important to our existence. We are ruthless to each other, we attack each other, we plot against each other, and we damn sure have a difficult time coming together to do anything positive for the entire black community or working together to grow businesses to empower our communities. And please don't tell me about the NAACP. I've had an issue in the past in which they didn't do a damn thing. You need to understand that in America, you will not see reparations for black people. They dance around the question, they redirect the question, and other times they flat out say no. They ignore the fact that for generations they made sure we were educated less than the white children. They ignore the fact that for generations they made sure we earned less than the white people. And they damn sure ignore the fact that for decades they destroyed every community we have built that rivaled and even surpassed theirs. Then they want to spread lies and rumors that we are violent, angry, and destroy our own communities. Who destroyed Black Wall Street? Who destroyed Rosewood? Their own history tells the world that angry white people destroyed those flourishing black communities. My Black History Monday series provides more details about those and other racial massacres. So let's hear what some of your elected politicians have thought about reparations over the years. This clip is from one of the 2007 Democratic presidential debates. Almost 50% of South Carolina's Democrats are African Americans. It's among the highest percentage of the nation. So we're getting a lot of questions uh, from YouTube viewers on race tonight. This first one is for Senator Edwards. Let's listen. Hello, America. Hello, presidential candidates. This is Will from Boston, Massachusetts. And I hope, you know, they put this question on. It's a question in the back of everybody's head, you know. Some people is further back than others collecting cobwebs. But 
Is African Americans ever going to get reparations for slavery? I know y'all going to run around this question dipping and dodging. So let's see how far y'all can get. Senator Edwards, no dipping and dodging. Should African Americans get reparations? Not, not for reparations. I can answer that question. But I think there are other things we can do to create some equality that doesn't exist in this country today. Today, there was a report that right here in Charleston, African Amer Americans are paying more than their white counterparts for mortgages than any other place in America, any other place in the United States of America. And here's an example. What is the conceivable explanation for this? That black people are paying more for their mortgages. And by the way, it's not just low-income African Americans. It's high-income African Americans. There's absolutely no explanation for this. It goes to the basic question that I raised just a few minutes ago. To have a president that's going to, create, is going to fight for equality, fight for real change, big change, bold change. We're going to have to have somebody. We can't trade our insiders for their insiders. That doesn't work. What we need is somebody who will take these people on, these big banks, these mortgage companies, big insurance companies, big drug companies. That's the only way we're going to bring about change, and I will do that as president. Senator Obama, your position on reparations? I, I, I think the reparations we need uh, right here in South Carolina is investment, for example, in our schools. Uh, yeah, I, I did a... I, uh, I, I, did a, I did a town hall meeting in Florence, South Carolina, uh, in an area called the Corridor of Shame. They've got buildings uh, that students are trying to learn in that were built right after the Civil War. Uh, and uh, we've got teachers uh, who are not trained to teach the subjects they're teaching in, high uh, dropout rates. We've got to understand that there are corridors of shame all across the country. And if we make the investments and understand that those are our children, that's the kind of reparations that are really going to make a difference is, is in America anyone, right is, now. Is anyone on the stage for reparations for slavery for African Americans? Are you? I am. The Bible says we shall be and must be repairers of the breach. And a breach has occurred, and we have to acknowledge that. It's a breach that has resulted in inequality and opportunities for education, for health care, for housing, for employment. And so we must be mindful of that. But it's also a breach that has affected a lot of poor whites as well. We need to have a country which recognizes that there is an inequality of opportunity and a president who's ready to challenge the interest groups, be they insurance companies or mortgage companies or defense contractors who are taking the money away from the people Time. who need it. Yes, I am for repairing the breach. Yes, I am for reparations. So did you notice that John Edwards was given approximately 57 seconds to dance around the question and completely redirect it into something else? Did you also notice that Obama was given approximately 43 seconds to completely transform the question into an issue about education in South Carolina while brilliantly bringing up another subject to distract everyone? Did you also notice that Dennis Kucinich was given approximately 37 seconds and was the only candidate to make sense and make a case for black people? Also notice that Anderson Cooper said time at approximately the 32 second mark. He was the only person Anderson Cooper attempted to silence because he's talking about black people in a positive light. Here is what Bernie Sanders thinks about reparations. Why not, why not support reparations? Well, what do you mean by reparations? By reparations for slave defense. I know, but what does that mean exactly? Money. Well, I think that right now uh, our job is to address the crises facing uh, the American people and our communities. And I think there are better ways to do that uh, than just writing out a check. Why aren't you uh, for reparations for uh, having to because of slavery for African Americans? When you're calling for economic justice on so many other levels, why do you stop short on that issue? Well, for the same reason that Barack Obama has, the same reason I believe that Hillary Clinton has. Uh, and that is, it is absolutely uh, wrong and unacceptable that we have so much poverty in this country and it is even worse in the African-American community. That African-American kids between 17 and 20 who graduate high school have unemployment rates and underemployment rates of 51%. The 36% of African-American children are living in poverty. This is an issue that we have got to address. And my intention as President of the United States is to be very aggressive in dealing with those issues, to put our kids to work rather than see them go to jail, to improve mm -hmm. our schools, 
That's what we have to do, and I think that's what the American people want. I understand that, but you didn't answer the question why you, why you, were, uh, why you weren't in favor of reparations. Well, again, it's, it's the same reason that the president is not, and, and I think and what is know, that Secretary reason? Clinton is not. We have got to invest in the future. What we have got to do is address poverty in America, something that very few people talk about, and especially poverty in the African-American community and the Latino community. And if you look at my record and if you look at my agenda, raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, creating millions of jobs by rebuilding our infrastructure, focusing on high rates of youth unemployment, I think our candidacy is the candidacy talking to the issues of the African-American community. Well, let me ask you, though, many African-Americans, they hear that, and some will say, okay, he's talking about major economic justice, but an African-American hand raises his hand, and he says, well, can't get that through Congress. Can't, you, know, you can't deal with this because it's politically very difficult. Um, a lot of your other plans are going to be politically difficult, if not impossible. Well, look, this is what I think. That, that is looking at politics today as a zero-sum approach. And what I am trying to do in this country is to say, you know what? In the last election, 63% of the American people didn't vote. 80% of young people didn't vote in the midterm election. That is why the rich get richer. And that is why billionaires are able to buy elections. What we are trying to do is say that in American democracy, maybe it's a radical idea, but Congress should represent working families in the middle class rather than just wealthy campaign contributors. So, Chuck, what I am trying to do now is change the dynamics of American politics, bring millions of young people, working class people, in to stand up and fight for their rights. When you do that, yes, we can raise the minimum wage, we can create jobs, we can make public colleges mm -hmm. and universities tuition free. You know, and that I is what we have got to do. You know, and I Here is Kamala Harris's epic two minute answer to a simple yes or no question in which she didn't even answer the question. Do you support reparations for black people? Well, listen, again, we had over 200 years of slavery. We had Jim Crow for almost a, a, a century. We had legalized discrimination and segregation, and now we have it, it, segregation and discrimination that is not legal but still exists and is a barrier to progress. We have disparities around housing. We have disparities around education. We have disparities around income. And we have to recognize that Everybody did not start out on an equal footing in this country. And in particular, black people have not. And so we have got to recognize that and do something about that and give folks a lift up. That's why, for example, I'm proposing the LIFT Act. Give people who are making $100,000 or less as a family a tax credit, which will benefit and uplift 60% of black families who are in poverty. So by default, it affects black families, but there's not a particular policy for African Americans that you would explore. But no, if you look at the, the reality of who will benefit from certain policies, when you take into account that they're not starting at, at, at the same place and they're not, stand, they're not starting on equal footing, it will directly benefit black children, black families, black homeowners, because the disparities are so significant. So if we focus on the specific issues that have resulted in the greatest disparities. And we understand that that's part of why we're doing it. Listen, the, the reality also is this. Any policy that will benefit black people will benefit all of society. Let's be clear about that. Let's really be clear about that. So I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No, because whatever benefits that black family will benefit that community and society as a whole in the country. Vice President Biden, do you support reparations? Well, let, let me, since I haven't spoken on this, got a chance. Um, number one, the reason we're the country we are is because of immigration. We've been able to cherry pick the best from every single continent. The people who come here have determination, resilience. They are ready to stand up and work like the devil. We have 24 out of our 100 children in our school today is Hispanic. 
The idea that we are going to walk away and not provide every opportunity for them is not only stupid and immoral, but it's bad for America. They are the future of America, and we should invest in them. Everybody will benefit from it, every single American. And you should get used to it. This is a nation of immigrants. That's who we are. That's why we're who we are. That's what makes us different, and we should invest in them. Thank you, Mr. Biden. I have spoken on the Douglas plan earlier. Um, a few statistics. Uh, black Americans are 14% of the country, population-wise, yet we own around 2.6% of the wealth in this nation. My question is twofold. There's been a lot of talk about reparations. Where do you stand personally in principle regarding cash payment reparations for the descendants of American slaves? And if you don't support that, where do you stand? What closes that black white racial wealth gap? Mm -hmm. So, first of all, there is no question that this racial wealth gap is a consequence of systemic racism in this country. Now, I support H.R. 40, uh, the bill that has been proposed in the House to create a commission uh, that will evaluate reparations. But I don't think we have to wait for that commission to do its work to do certain other things. And that's what's in the Douglas plan. The way I think of it is, is this if I save a dollar today, at 5% interest, it's going to turn into $2, and then $4, and then $8. And actually, if it stays in that bank account, 150 years from now, my descendants would have $1,000 off of that $1. Now, if that's true for a dollar that's been saved, that's also true for a dollar that's been stolen. And what has been stolen from black Americans is generational opportunities to build up wealth. And so we shouldn't be surprised that when slavery ended, two lifetimes ago, less than two lifetimes ago, uh, that we continue to see the consequences of that, in addition to things that are not from some distant, far-off, quaint past, but happen within living memory. The inability of people who return from war to access the, the GI Bill. I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a good idea. Uh, we've, you know, tried to deal with our original sin of slavery by fighting a civil war, by passing uh, landmark civil rights legislation. Uh, we've elected an African-American president. I, I think we're always a work in progress in this country. Uh, but no one currently alive was responsible for that. And I don't think we should be uh, trying to figure out uh, how to compensate for it. First of all, it'd be pretty hard to figure out who to compensate. We've had waves of immigrants as well who've come to the country and experienced dramatic uh, uh, discrimination of one kind or another. So no, I don't think reparations are a good idea. Look, I don't have to go much further than this regarding what your elected officials feel about reparations. It doesn't matter if they are Democrats or Republicans because none of them care enough about reparations for the descendants and slaves to ever do a damn thing about it. Let's look at it another way. The following companies benefited from slavery, and to this day, some of them have apologized, but that was only because the truth was revealed to the public and the world. Let's take a look at some more. Now, not on these lists is the Bank of England. When the bank was established, it was one of the pioneers in commercial credit, which was used to finance slavery. Wealthy politicians and city residents with hefty titles such as governor contributed to the slave trade by providing funding to the sustainability of slave routes, slave colonies, as well as the military and naval entities that protected slave routes and plantations. In 1927, the Bank of England merged with Lloyds Bank, another company that assisted in financing the slave trade. This rabbit hole is extremely deep, virtually bottomless. 
When you think of how much was lost in all the massacres and destruction of all the black communities due to the race hate and anger, then yes, the descendants deserve reparations because they need to be paid back for the generations of deliberate and focused discrimination that decimated their finances. This is an excerpt from a report by the Oklahoma Commission to study the Tulsa race riot of 1921. Sinclair Oil Company owned one of the airplanes used to drop firebombs on people and buildings. Polite white people want to excuse what happened as being caused by troublemaking blacks and white trash ruffians. Let that sink in for a minute. The black community was attacked. Then some of the white people tried to blame the victims for the incident. Black family, I need to say this again. They do not care about us. Michael Jackson wrote a song telling all of us they don't care about us. Did you all ever listen closely to the lyrics of that song? Let's take a look at some reparations that have been paid already. Native American reparations, belated payment for unjustly seized land. In 1946, Congress created the Indian Claims Commission, a body designed to hear historic grievances and compensate tribes for lost territories. It commissioned extensive historical research and ended up awarding about $1.3 billion to 176 tribes and bands. Native Hawaiian reparations, land leases for the overthrow of a kingdom. The Hawaiian Homes Commission Act of 1920 established a land trust for Native Hawaiians and allowed people of one-half Hawaiian ancestry by blood to lease homesteads from the federal government for 99 years at a time for a total of $1. Tuskegee Experiment Reparations – Compensation for Medical Brutality After a class action lawsuit, the men were awarded $10 million and the United States promised to provide health care and burial services for the men. That's not really reparations, is it? Because they had to file a lawsuit in order to get any traction on the situation. People of Japanese descent, reparations for internment during World War II. The Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was a bill which apologized for Japanese American internment and granted $20,000 to every survivor. Now, the U.S. apologized for slavery and segregation in 2009, but it has never issued redress to the descendants of enslaved people. When it comes to slavery, the United States has proven unwilling to grapple with the enormity of its injustice and of those that followed during Jim Crow segregation and the financial and social inequality faced by black Americans. In a recent Pew Research Center survey, most Americans said that slavery's legacy still affects black Americans to this day. But that understanding has not yet fueled an overwhelming public demand for reparations. Let's repeat it again. Black family. They do not care about us. Slavery reparations may be the single most divisive idea in American politics. Advocates have spent decades calling on the U.S. government to assess how such a policy could be implemented and to enact a law that might offer financial restitution to the descendants of enslaved people. But minds are made up. According to a recent Associated Press poll, 74% of African Americans now favor reparation payments, while 85% of whites oppose them, and Congress seems unlikely to take up the matter. Remember that H.R. 40 bill is more than 30 years old, and they've never taken it seriously despite the fact that some of these politicians are glamorizing the fact that they recently signed it. But they didn't tell you it was 30 years old, did they? None of this is surprising because they don't care about us. Moving into the military. It has long been known that enslaved laborers were used to build fortifications and man naval yards, but historians are now discovering another element of military enslavement. From the early 19th century through the end of the Civil War, the Army provided its officers with a monthly stipend to cover salaries for their personal servants. If these servants happened to be enslaved, then the officer could simply keep the money for himself as a bonus payment. So now let's talk about the generational wealth of a lot of these white families whose ancestors benefited from free slave labor for centuries. Mitch McConnell is just one example of generations of his family owning and benefiting from slave ownership. Now, in 1983, almost 120 years after the end of slavery, 
White Americans enjoyed a median household wealth, that's the value of all assets minus all debt, of $105,300, according to data gathered by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, a federal agency. For Black Americans, that figure was $7,000, and for Latinos, it was $4,000. Just look at the differences in home ownership between 2014 and 2018. Look at the difference in income for the same period. Let's look at this analogy from the Diversity Inc. website. The legacy of slavery has benefited every white person in this country directly and personally. In a very gross analogy, if you run a series of foot races for 300 years, but prevent 13% of the participants from learning how to run for 180 years, and then give them concrete sneakers for another 80 years, but allow them full access for 40 years, it will take the 13% quite a few races to be competitive because the other 87% advance their skills by practice and repetition. Life is not a foot race, but it is a fact that the average white person would not economically benefit from switching places with an average black person. Black households average one-tenth the household wealth of white households. If you believe all people are created equal, there has to be a reason for this, and there is. Racism. The excuse that your family never owned slaves or none of us were alive back then is just BS. Even if your ancestors were foreign but white and came to this country, their skin color ensured they would have a much easier time establishing a fruitful life than any black people already in this country. Think about this. If you caught black households up to white household wealth, it would be the equivalent of injecting the entire GDP of Japan into our economy. Unfortunately, even if that were to happen, mostly white people would benefit because the majority would manufacture the goods and services purchased with the new wealth. Many black people are mentally damaged by generations of emotional torture and have no sense of building their own communities and keeping the dollar circulating within those communities like we did during Black Wall Street. This has been your wake-up call.